The use of balloons as an air war mechanism was first recorded in France by the French Aerostatic Corps at the Battle of Fleurus in 1794. U.S. President Abraham Lincoln became interested in an air war mechanism for reconnaissance purposes in 1861 at the beginning of the American Civil War. The inventive president recognized the strategic advantage they gave his armies. This created a notion at the War Department and at the Treasury that some sort of balloon aviation unit needed to be established and headed by a chief aeronaut. Several top American balloonists traveled to Washington in hopes of obtaining just such a position from Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. However, there were no proposed details to the establishment of such a unit, or whether it would be a military or civilian operation. Nor was there any set method to the process of selecting a chief aeronaut. Rather, it became a free-for-all in attempts to attract the attention of any officials in either the government or the military. In actuality, the use of balloons was left to the discretion of the commanding generals through a process of trial and error based on the best recommendations of the balloonists themselves. Of those seeking the position, only two were given actual opportunities to perform combat aerial reconnaissance, Professor Thaddeus Lowe and Mr. John LaMountain. During the war, finding the target for your guns to shoot was not always an easy task. Balloons were used for surveillance and reconnaissance during the Civil War on both sides. The Union side invested heavily in their development. A number of junior officers were sent aloft to spot enemy positions for the Army of the Potomac, the most famous of whom was George Armstrong Custer. In early 1862, Custer served on the staff of General George McClellan, who led the Union Army into Virginia for the Peninsula Campaign. At one point, Custer was ordered to ascend in the basket of a tethered balloon with pioneering aeronaut Lowe to make observations of enemy positions. After some initial trepidation, Custer took to the daring practice and made numerous other ascents in the observation balloon. The ability to locate troops and assess their numbers quickly became a very important capability. But it is not known if a photograph from a balloon was ever taken because, to date, no vertical or oblique aerial photography captured by balloons from the Civil War period have been found. Because of the effectiveness of the Union Army Balloon Corps, the Confederates felt compelled to incorporate balloons as well. Since coke gas was not readily available in Richmond, the first balloons were made of the Montgolfier rigid style, cotton stretched over wood framing and filled with hot smoke from fires made of oil-soaked pine cones. They were piloted by Captain John R. Bryan for use at Yorktown. Bryan's handlers were poorly experienced and his balloon began spinning in the air. In another incident, one of the handlers became entangled in the ascending tether rope, which had to be chopped loose, leaving the captain free-flying over his own Confederate positions, whose troops threatened to shoot him down. Attempts at making gas-filled silk balloons were hampered by the South's inability to obtain any imports at all. They did, however, fashion a balloon from dress silk. Confederate Major General James Longstreet sent out orders to gather up all the silk dresses to be found in Richmond to fashion a balloon. The balloon was filled with coal gas and launched from a railroad car that its pilot, Edward Porter Alexander, had positioned near the battlefield. In late June 1862, Alexander made a few ascents in the balloon and was able to signal his observations of the battlefield to men on the ground using a wigwag system that he had devised. The coal gas used in the balloon was only able to keep the balloon aloft for about three to four hours at a time. A second balloon was put into action in the summer of 1863 when it was blown from its mooring and retrieved by Union forces and later divided up as souvenirs for members of the Federal Congress. As the Union Army reduced its use of balloons, so did the Confederates, 
1863, the Balloon Corps was disbanded, due in part to the fact that they drew attention and provided convenient targets, and also those involved, including Lowe, were not exactly honest, cooperative gentlemen. Also a factor in discontinuing this endeavor was that to counter the balloon advantage, the Confederate side started using deception techniques that caused severe miscalculations on the part of those who had come to rely on balloon observations for planning strategic movements. This technique of reconnaissance deception would continue in all the wars since that relied on aerial surveillance. It seems ironic that after a thousand generations of dreaming and planning, the first man to fly under power would win that history-making distinction when two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, tossed a coin on a windswept beach in North Carolina. Well, the Wright brothers became interested in aviation in the mid-1890s. They were newspaper publishers at that point and they were reading stories about Otto Lilienthal, who was a uh, experimenter in Germany. He was uh, flying uh, what we call hang gliders today um, and using his body as his control. Uh, and unfortunately, he, in one of his glides, uh, went out of control, crashed and died. Uh, and the Wright brothers seemed to be very affected by that and they kind of decided um, as their next challenge in life that they were going to take up the mantle of Lilienthal and uh, go further with this study of powered flight. The Wrights gathered every bit of information they could find on the study of flight and began to reassess that body of knowledge. The Wright brothers approached this um, from an engineering perspective. They, they weren't trained as engineers, but they had very logical minds. And so uh, the first thing they did was they went out and found out as much as they possibly could uh, about what was known about heavier than air flight. Um, they, they read everything they could find. They rode away to uh, Samuel Langley at the Smithsonian. They got in touch with Octave Chanute, who was also publishing in this area. Um, and they decided then that the three problems that needed to be solved were uh, propulsion, um, lift, and control. Uh, they felt that propulsion was their least of their problems. They felt that once they had a machine, finding an engine to power it was not going to be a problem. Lift, they thought, had been fairly well solved by Lilienthal. They had his lift tables. And so they tackled the issue of control. And so that's how their experiments began. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to control an aircraft in flight. And they, um, they were among the first to really understand that an aircraft flies in three dimensions. Um, and so you not only had to be able to control it in pitch with your elevator, which was a fairly known technology, or yaw with a rudder, which was a known technology, but also in the roll mode. And that's what they began to, to play with. And Wilbur apparently was uh, fiddling with a, a box that a, an inner tube had come in at their bicycle shop and began twisting it and realized that, a, um, that this twisting motion would uh, induce roll, just like a, a bird twists his wingtips to induce roll, that if they could devise wings that could warp or twist, that they could induce roll in their machines. So they began with these kites to test their wing warping structure. Then they went from the kites to the gliders, and then from the gliders to the powered aircraft in a very short period of time. Time was not on the brothers' side. Around the world, in tiny workshops and government-funded labs, others were trying to solve the riddle of manned flight. In the 1890s and early 20th century, um, there were people all over the world who were investigating uh, the possibility of heavier-than-air powered flight. Uh, they were doing it in England, they were doing it in France, they, there were other people in the United States who were working on it. The Wright brothers really were part of this 
kind of larger international community of people who were doing uh, experiments, who were, who were studying the problem. The Wrights were drawing on a lot of that work. Um, and so there's a sense that if the Wright brothers had not become involved in the 1890s when they did, that heavier than air powered flight probably would have been invented anyway because there were other people who were um, on the verge. Uh, they weren't as far advanced in thinking about it as the Wright brothers were, but you had Santos Dumont, for example, flying shortly after the Wright brothers in France. Uh, and so um, it, it, in parallel development, uh, there were people who were going to get a heavier than air powered machine up in the air. Now how controlled it was going to be, how sophisticated it was going to be, uh, that was another question. The rights were well ahead on that uh, count. But uh, in terms of uh, a, an airplane, um, there were a lot of people who were, who were capable of doing it about the same time that the Wright brothers did, which is in part why the Wright brothers uh, so emphasized the fact that they did it on December 17, 1903, that they were ahead of all of these other people who they saw as their competitors in this field. In late September, the Wright brothers headed to North Carolina with their flyer, well aware that at that very moment, Samuel Pierpoint Langley was preparing for the first flight of his great aerodrome. And he actually makes two attempts at heavier than air powered manned flight, uh, first in October of 1903, and then in early December of 1903. When news came that Langley's first attempt had failed, Wilbur wrote in his journal, It seems to be our turn to throw now, and I wonder what our luck will be. For a time, it seemed that luck was against them. In stationary tests, the engine controls failed, damaging the propeller and cracking the shaft. It was then discovered that all the flyer's shafts were faulty. Orville was forced to return to Dayton to make new ones, delaying the first flight by several weeks. A vital contributor of mechanical skills in the building and maintaining of early Wright engines and airplanes was Charlie Taylor. He was kind of the forgotten man of the team for a while, because uh, he, he really was the one who figured out how to, to use um, the drill presses and things that they had at their bicycle shop to fabricate this engine and have it um, generate enough uh, horsepower at a light enough a weight to be able to get the aircraft off the uh, off the ground. I started on repairing bicycles back in uh, in the 80s, and then I later went to Dayton and built bicycles for the Stoddard Manufacturing Company, and they were just starting up in the bicycle business. Then I sure. I got acquainted with the Wrights and I would build bicycles for them. I did all the repair work while they went down Kitty Hawk to try out their gliders. Um, they couldn't find a gasoline powered engine that was both powerful enough and light enough to do the job and so they designed their own and they had a mechanic named Charles Taylor who they um, charged with building it and it really was very innovative. It was the first solid block aluminum engine. Uh, it would generate uh, 14 horsepower, uh, and that's exactly what they needed, and so they had their engine. Well, and all they needed was power to keep on flying. Why then, when they designed the motor, I made, made all the different parts in the, in the motor. I even made the crankshaft. So, I made it out of a solid block of steel, uh, about 32 inches long, six inches wide, and inch and five eighths thick. Cut it right out of the solid block by drilling holes and knocking out large pieces out of it, and then, uh, then turning it up in the lathe. The motor itself, from the time I started, well, I had it ready for test, was six weeks. In the meantime, Langley made a second attempt to fly his aerodrome on December 8th, but it ended in a crash into the Potomac River.
Now, finally, Lady Luck smiled on the brothers from Dayton. Well, um, it happened on a cold December morning. Um, they had tried to fly a few days before uh, and had been unsuccessful. Uh, they had rested on Sunday. They were very religious. They were the sons of a bishop, and so they, they rested. And then um, they decided to, to try once again. On the morning of December 17, 1903, the wind at Kill Devil Hill was gusting at up to 30 miles an hour. Because he won a coin toss with his brother Wilbur, Dayton bicycle mechanic and inventor Orville Wright would have the honor of first turn at the controls of their untested flyer. They had flipped a coin to see who was going to try and fly first. And uh, on that unsuccessful flight, Wilbur actually had won the coin toss. Uh, and that hadn't worked, so now it was Orville's turn. At 10 a.m., a flag was run up to signal to the personnel of the nearby life-saving station that all was ready. The lifeguards had agreed to act as witnesses if all went well and as a rescue team if disaster struck. Orville and Wilbur then set about laying a wooden launch track alongside their campsite. The flyer was too heavy to be launched like a glider, so the machine was to be launched from a trolley running alongside a wooden rail. The brothers stood by the machine as the engine warmed up. When all was ready, they shook hands, holding each other's hand like two folks parting, unsure that they would ever see each other again. A camera was positioned to capture the flight, and one of the lifeguards was entrusted to operate the shutter. Orville mounted the machine lying face down. Then, amid the noise of the engine and shouts from the crowd, the flyer was released from its restraining rope and set off along the track. Wilbur was running alongside, um, kind of steadying the wings as it, as it went. It lifted into the air as the historic picture was snapped. They had asked um, one of their friends from the lifeguard station to man their camera. The Wright brothers were really uh, very zealous about recording everything that they did. So they had him manning their camera and told him to, to snap off a picture as soon as the aircraft uh, took off, which of course becomes one of the most famous pictures in, in history. Um, and off he flew. Orville found the flyer hard to control. And after 12 seconds in the air, he came down with a bump. The brothers made four flights that day. Wilbur flew for 59 seconds, traveling a distance of 852 feet, before coming down with a bone-jarring thump that broke the elevator's support. And then they realized that they had done what they wanted to do. Uh, they had proved heavier-than-air, man-powered, controlled, sustained flight, and they packed up and came home for Christmas. I remember the telegram when it come, that they had flown, that they had done what they said they would do. They always did as they had planned. Of course, I was greatly pleased to know that it had been accomplished, but at that time, it didn't seem to be anything wonderful at, at that. The flyer had spent less than a minute in the air, but that was long enough to constitute sustained, controlled power flight. Five years after those first flights, the Wrights had worked like men possessed to refine and sell their flyer. They knew that after that, those flights at Kitty Hawk that they still needed to perfect their machine. They had, they had essentially a proof of concept prototype. They really didn't have a workable airplane. So they knew they needed to refine the machine. They also knew that if they were going to have full credit for this, that they needed to file a patent. They had filed a patent on their control system in 1902, um, but it was still pending. And so they were, they were awaiting the patent uh, award, and they were also working on refining their aircraft. They, they knew that they had to fly for more than 59 seconds and, uh, and at low level if anyone was really going to see any value in their machine. 
The much improved Flyer 3 made flights of up to 38 minutes duration, covering more than 20 miles at a time. If anyone wanted to question whether the Wright brothers flight in 1903 deserved to be called the first, there could be no doubt whatsoever that by the end of 1905, they were the only people in the world with a practical flying machine. In 1904 and 1905, they set up an experimental station out at what's known as the Huffman Prairie Flying Field. Uh, Torrance Huffman was a local landowner who said, sure, come on out, you can use my uh, cow pasture, just make sure that, that you close the gates behind you so my cows don't wander. Um, and they, they built a small hangar out there and began to uh, work on their machine to refine it. Um, they run, ran into a number of problems during 1904. Uh, it took them a long time to duplicate the flights that they had had at Kitty Hawk. Um, then in 1905, they, uh, by 1905, they'd come up with a, a launching mechanism, uh, uh, a big derrick with a weight that would come down that would help uh, accelerate the aircraft a little faster on the rail that they had. Um, they refined the, the rudder and the elevator system. Um, and finally, in October of 1905, they had an aircraft which, if they, they took off, they could fly it for as long as the gas held out. Um, and it was at that point that they knew that they really had a practical flying machine. It was now that the brothers made the decision to cease all future flying experiments. The Wrights decided to devote much of their efforts to the search for a lucrative business contract. The obvious potential customer for the new flying machine was the Army. The United States government did not at first seem to recognize the potential of the airplane. The Wrights did want to sell their machine to the government sight unseen. Um, they saw themselves as very upstanding, moral, uh, honest citizens, and if they told the government that they had a machine capable of sustained, powered, manned, controlled flight, then the government ought to believe them. In 1905, the War Department refused three separate offers by the Wright brothers to share their scientific discoveries on air flights. Faced with rejection at home, the Wrights approached the British and French military. A French delegation even visited Dayton in the spring of 1906, but no agreement was reached. The decision to stop flying was risky. Aviation enthusiasts knew details of most aspects of their work. This information gave others a serious chance to catch up and overtake the brothers. Even Alexander Graham Bell caught aviation fever. In 1907, he created the Aerial Experiment Association in New York, bringing together a team that included motorcycle manufacturer and future aviation legend, Glenn H. Curtis. By the winter of 1907-08, pushed into action by increasingly successful flights of other experimenters, the Wright brothers finally agreed to deals to market the machine. In the United States, the War Department, encouraged by President Theodore Roosevelt, requested bids for a heavier-than-air flying machine. Specifications issued by the U.S. Army Signal Corps required that any proposed flyer be able to carry two persons, fly a distance of 125 miles at an average speed of 40 miles an hour. The Wright signed an agreement to produce a demonstration aircraft that could meet those stiff requirements. On hand for the demonstrations was Lieutenant Frank P. Lom, who in 1909 became the United States Army's first certified pilot. After four long years of failing to recognize the rights, finally, in December of 1907, the Board of Ordnance and Fortification granted the interview to Wilbur. At once, he inspired their confidence. This led to a contract in February of 1908 between the Wright brothers and the Signal Corps in which they agreed to furnish an airplane that would fly 40 miles an hour 
carry two persons, remain in the air for one hour, and, strange to relate, was to have some kind of a device by which, in case the motor stopped, it could be landed without crashing. That summer, the Wrights delivered their first plane designed to meet the Army's requirements. After practice hops, Orville Wright, with Lieutenant Frank Lom as a passenger, made the first official test flight of the new flyer, designated Signal Corps SC No. 1. In the summer of 1908, Orville Wright brought to Fort Myer, Virginia, the airplane that was to fill their specifications of the contract. Day after day, we watched him go fly around and around the field in his tuning up flights. And finally, on the 9th of September, he broke the world's record by staying in the air for over one hour. On landing, he came to me and said, would you like to go up? You can guess my answer. And I made my first flight in an airplane that day with Orville Wright, six minutes and 40 seconds. An airplane seemed to be one of those inventions that you had to see before you could believe. Um, people might believe other things had been invented, telephones, light bulbs, whatever, but an airplane? Really? They had to come and see it, and so just throngs of people uh, come to Fort Myer to witness these flights. In the crowd watching as they rolled out the new flyer was a 16-year-old Naval Academy midshipman and future aircraft designer, Donald Douglas. I guess I must be getting old, because somehow it becomes fun to reminisce. Well, my first memory of things in aviation was seeing the first Wright airplane demonstrated for the Signal Corps in 1908 at uh, Fort Myers, outside of Washington. So I took the streetcar and one thing and another and got out to Fort Myer. Well, there she was, as I had seen her pictured, the old right pusher. And there were Wilbur and Orville. And there was that old launching device that kind of looked like a guillotine, and they had the airplane perched up at the starting part of the track and the weight all ready to go. And I remember well, I believe it was Wilbur, going out and holding up a bit of dust and dropping it to see that there wasn't a bit of wind. And then, as I recall, it was Wilbur that got into the machine with, I guess it was Colonel Lom. And they pulled the old latch and down this little wooden track it went with those funny old props that and around at pretty, pretty slow speed, and off she went. While Orville stayed behind to prepare for the U.S. military trials, Wilbur set off for France shipping an unassembled flyer ahead of him. It turned out the machine was damaged in customs and Wilbur had to spend weeks making repairs. Over the following months, Wilbur flew repeatedly, attracting huge crowds wherever he went. He also extended his airtime with an extraordinary flight of two hours, 20 minutes, and an altitude record of 360 feet, proving that flight had become practical and safe. Moving back to Fort Myer, Virginia, Orville's experience was less reassuring. The airplane now was uh, much different from the 1903 and 1905 flyers. Uh, two people were on it. Uh, Orville was the pilot, and then he could also carry a passenger. That had been one of the government's uh, requirements. Uh, if the military was going to use it, you needed a pilot and an observer in it. So it was a two-person machine. They sat upright. Um, and then Orville flew, he would fly out of Fort Myers, he'd fly down toward the um, George Washington Masonic Temple, uh, that was a nice big landmark to fly, circle around, uh, and he did a number of demonstration flights there. In the summer of 1909, both Wilbur and Orville Wright came to Fort Myers, this time with a new airplane. It fulfilled the specifications, including an hour's flight which is my good fortune to ride with Orville for an hour and 12 minutes. On the day following the endurance uh, test with Orville Wright and uh, Lieutenant Lom, uh, the Orville, with a quiet little grin on his face, uh, invited me to be his guest on the uh, crucial and final cross-country and speed tests. The grin on Orville's face was for my benefit. 
particularly as I'd been responsible for laying out the course between Fort Myer and Alexandria, Virginia, and there was not a landing field on the entire out, uh, out or bound, homebound course except Fort Myer drill ground. On July 30th, we took off on the uh, final cross country and speed test. Shortly after we straightened out on the course for Alexandria, Orville, with this same little grin on his face, told me that uh, if he had to land anywhere on the route, and he'd pick out the thickest clump of trees he could find and land on top of them. Fortunately, the little engine that we had at the time carried us all the way through without any difficulty. And we finally landed back at Fort Margill Ground with three world records, cross country, 10 miles, altitude 600 feet, and speed 42 and a half miles an hour. His flights were successful until September 17th, when his flyer crashed with a military observer, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge, aboard. Again, the, the military had wanted this to be a two-person machine, and so Orville had to demonstrate that a, a second person could be in there. Well, he, a number of passengers had flown, um, but on one of the flights, uh, a Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge, who had actually been working with Alexander Graham Bell and his group, who were also developing an airplane at this time uh, with Glenn Curtis, uh, he was at Fort Myer, and uh, Orville uh, allowed him to sit in the passenger seat. They took off and were flying around Fort Myer when something happened. Um, People aren't really sure exactly what happened, but um, either a, a wire broke or the propeller shattered, something. Uh, but something went terribly wrong with the airplane, and it crashed. Uh, Orville was very badly injured in the accident, uh, suffered from his injuries for the rest of his life. Uh, Selfridge, who, who was sitting in the observer's seat, was uh, sitting in front of the engine. And when they crashed, the engine came forward and hit him in the back of the head, and he was killed in the crash. Orville suffered a fractured thigh, broken ribs, and a serious head wound. The unfortunate Lieutenant Selfridge was pulled from the twisted wreckage with a fractured skull. His death several hours later gave him the dubious honor of being the first person to be killed in a powered aircraft. In spite of the disaster, the Army had seen enough to place an order. Actually, um, the military was pretty well ready to buy the aircraft at that point, um, but they did need to then create a, another model for them, uh, and they will buy the first aircraft in 1909, right after those trials. The trials were a success despite the, uh, the fatality. Meanwhile, in France, Wilbur, acting as pilot, mechanic, ground crew, and salesman, was winning converts with his flights. Before each flight, a team of horses pulled the plane to a wooden monorail, which provided a level runway for takeoffs on terrain that was often grassy and uneven. The flyer would be propelled along the monorail by a catapult devised by Wilbur to give it the thrust it needed to reach takeoff speed. On the broad backs of willing bystanders, the flyer was lifted into position always facing straight into the wind, which would provide the lift needed to get the flyer aloft. Once Wilbur, and occasionally with the passengers seated on the lower wing, were in place, an assistant spun the propellers and the engine kicked over. With the engine spitting and sputtering, the flyer was catapulted down the monorail and the brief hair-raising ride commenced. Wherever he went in Europe, Wilbur won admiring applause from his delighted spectators. By 1909, the Wrights were busy demonstrating their flyer and fulfilling the business offers coming in. They were also having to train pilots, since they were the only ones who knew how to fly their machine. Frank Lom and 2nd Lieutenant Frederick E. Humphreys were selected as the first candidates. 
Wilbur Wright trained both at a field in College Park, Maryland. There in the fall of 1909, under Wilbur Wright's instruction, a Lieutenant F.E. Humphrey of U.S. engineers and myself were taught to fly and at the end of some three hours were soloed and told we were pilots. Remarkably, by 1910, the Wrights soon began to fade as a market leader. Instead of concentrating their efforts on the development of their airplanes, they spent most of their time on legal actions against those they thought were infringing on their patents. The endless stress took its toll on Wilbur, and in 1912, he died of typhoid fever. Orville ended his relationship with the Wright Company in 1915, he died in Dayton in 1948, living long enough to see manned flight break the sound barrier. If it had been slow to realize the potential of the Wright Flyer, the U.S. Army more than made up for lost time in assimilating the heavier-than-aircraft into its war plans. We didn't even have an Arrow Squadron until something like 1914 or so. And the great man in that period was Benjamin Folloy, F-O-U-L-O-I-S. And Folloy has been far overshadowed now by Billy Mitchell, but Billy Mitchell didn't even learn how to fly till 1916, and he was not considered a very good flyer. Folloy was one of the first two people testing the plane with the rights. And then in 1910, he and some enlisted men, four I think it was, that was the Air Force. One plane, one pilot, and these guys. And it was a long time before they really got going. They did, he commanded the squadron. They went down in the uh, punitive expedition in Mexico in 1916. And most of the planes crashed down there because they were in high altitudes and they couldn't do it. So they were not that effective down there. So it was really, a uh, Things had to happen and happen fast over here in developing things. And of course, what we used initially were the British or French planes. In addition to the Wright brothers, the Army turned to another aviation pioneer, Glenn Curtis, to build some of the early trainers for the Army. Soon, more inventors found ways to improve on the machine, such as using tractor instead of pusher propellers and the Army began to see the airplane as a promising weapon system. By 1913, 41 Army pilots had earned the right to wear the gold military aviator wings. Among them was Lieutenant Henry Hap Arnold, who later, as commanding general of the Army Air Forces, led two and a half million airmen to victory in World War II. The first appearances of the airplane over a battlefield were almost larks. The distinction of being the first flyers to observe war from the air may belong to Roland Garros and Charlie Hamilton, members of an exhibition troupe performing in Mexico during a revolution in February 1911. The pilots decided to use their aircraft to have a look at the hostilities. Later that year, airplanes did go into combat with the Italian army which was waging a colonial war with Turkey in North Africa. In October, Captain Carlo Piazza, who had won the 1911 Circuit of Italy, flew a scouting mission over the Turkish lines in Libya. A week later, Lieutenant Julio Gavati led a contingent of Italian planes on history's first live bombing run. Gavati's four bombs were grenades that he carried in a leather bag. When he reached his target areas, a Turkish encampment and vital oasis, he held his Taub monoplane on course with his knees, then tossed his deadly cargo out. By all evidence, the raid caused more consternation than carnage. The serio-comic aspect of early warfare vanished soon enough. 
Since 1911, the European powers had been building up their air arms for the larger conflict that, with increasing certainty, lay ahead. The European powers were in an arms buildup for most of the early 20th century. They, they were building up their navies, they were building up their armies. Uh, here was another potential weapon for them, and um, they, they weren't going to let anybody else get something that might give them an advantage in this arms race. So Britain, France, Germany, Italy, they're all interested in this new technology. Many of them bought early Wright aircraft or the rights to build early Wright aircraft. Um, and they were, they were looking ahead to a war that they were pretty sure was going to happen. Uh, they didn't know exactly when, they didn't know exactly where, but they were pretty sure that in the not too distant future, there was going to be a war in Europe one way or the other and everyone wanted to have the best uh, weaponry, the best equipment possible. And so they began to pour some money into all kinds of military technology, but aircraft are included in this. By the spring of 1912, the French army, the most air-minded in Europe, had increased its fleet of planes to 254. Um, in 1908, when Wilbur made his flights in Europe, that was state of the art. The French, when they saw him fly, said, we are beaten. You know, that was the state of the art aircraft. The Wrights don't advance much after 1908 either. Uh, it's still kind of the open, boxy kind of airplane. That's the kind of airplane they sell to the United States military in 1909. Um, and uh, for a whole host of reasons, um, it doesn't advance as quickly in the United States. The British had been slow getting into military aviation, but at the urging of such hawkish politicians as Winston Churchill, the government was now making up for lost time. In April of 1912, the Royal Flying Corps was established to serve both the Army and the Navy. They were actually, some of them had um, maneuverability, not necessarily in their design, but because of the, the rotary engines. Uh, they could turn really tightly uh, in the opposite direction because of gyroscopic precession. Um, the engine's turning and they could turn off in the other direction very quickly. Turning in the direction that the engine was turning was another story. Uh, but they had a certain level of uh, maneuverability. But it, it, was, it was pretty, pretty limited. These were uh, boxy, draggy um, aircraft. Um, but they, they were far in advance of what had been flying just a few years before. Like the British, the Germans had lagged years behind the French in perceiving the wartime potential of the airplane. The first heavier-than-air flight in Germany was made in 1908 by a Dane, J.C.H. Elehammer, and received scant notice. Germans were so intrigued with rigid dirigibles developed by Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin that for a time, little private or government money went to airplane development. Then, in an effort to catch up, the fledgling German aircraft industry began borrowing freely from French designs. The German Aviatique biplane was modeled on the Farman and the Euler on the Voisin and the Albatross on both the Farman and another French plane, the Sommer. The Germans also acquired one of aviation's improvisational geniuses in the person of a brash and very young Dutchman named Anthony Fokker. On the eastern edge of Europe, Igor Sikorsky had begun experimenting with a helicopter design in 1908. Discouraged when his 25-horsepower Anzani engine failed to deliver enough lifting power to the rotor blades, Sikorsky turned to designing a series of large fixed-wing machines, the world's first practical four-engine planes. In 1912, I decided that the time came to build a large machine with several motors. At that time, I was certain already that the future of aviation will be connected with fairly large aircraft, that the closed cabin, with its comfort, protection from wind and so forth, represent a must. In 13, I completed my first 
four motor aeroplane, <coughs> the Grand. The ship proved a complete success. It flew quite well. In contrast to the European powers, the United States devoted minuscule amounts of money and attention to military aviation in the pre-war years. Isolated by the broad Atlantic from the political tremors that were shaking the continent, Americans felt no urgent need to build an Air Force. As late as 1913, the United States government was spending less than Bulgaria on military aviation. In 1911, the United States Army conducted the world's first live bomb test from a standard Wright biplane. And it was the United States Navy, with an assist from Glenn Curtis, that launched naval aviation in the winter of 1910-1911, with the first successful shipboard takeoffs and landings. These pioneering flights, however modest, presaged an era in which great aircraft carriers would roam the world's oceans, launching combat planes at targets on land and sea. But few people at the time envisioned the modern carrier. By 1913, aviation's first and perhaps most colorful decade was over. In the flick of time since the first flights at Kill Devil Hill, man had established himself in this new element. By 1914, planes had been built that could climb to 20,000 feet, travel as fast as 127 miles an hour, and cover 635 miles without a stop. The roster of those who had mastered the rudiments of flying had grown from only two, Wilbur and Orville Wright, to more than 2,000 men and women who would call themselves aviators. By 1918, over two million pilots will take to the air over the battlefields of the Great War.